talk for a second about how to survive this 2024 election and its aftermath as a Christian, especially and relationally, like in the church and in your families. First, I just want to exhort everybody to avoid conspiracy theories. You know, conspiracy theories were alive and well in the New Testament times, and Paul specifically tells Timothy over and over again to avoid things that push off into like the speculative sort of thin ice space. Yeah, he, he says avoid myths and endless genealogies and, and all sorts of speculations. It says that don't advance God's work, but create a controversial speculation. Not everybody can meet you in that little pet theory that you have. And so you narrow and ostracize yourself. The whole church can't meet you out there. And so try, just try to avoid conspiracy theories. Really do try to fact check stuff. There's enough real things out there to be upset about and reasons probably to vote either way on this thing. You don't have to go for that fringe theory. So avoid the controversial speculations. Avoid conspiracy theories. That's number one. Number two, we have to learn to interpret the other side, somebody who's voting differently from you, from their point of view. In communication, we have transmitters, people who are sending a signal, and receivers. So if you see somebody voting a certain way or a sign in their yard, they're transmitting a signal to you, and you're likely to receive that through your own field of view, your own field of understanding. But to be a really active listener, we have to try to understand what they mean. So you may see somebody vote this way or that way and say they hate life, they hate immigrants, whatever, because that's what that would mean if you did that. But you have to learn to interpret from the transmitter's point of view. I remember taking a communication class one time, and the whole class had, uh, well, there was a video in the class, and people from maybe 20 or 30 different cultures came up, and they had to make that signal right there in front of the camera, say nothing, and then walk away. And for some of the people that walked up, that was great. They had, you could see by their nonverbal, they just did that with a smile and then left. But there were some people that stepped up, and that was a highly offensive gesture in their culture. And you could see that they were deeply embarrassed, kind of like if I was to do the middle finger right now. I would be embarrassed to do that. That would be vulgar. So if somebody is making a certain signal, we have to learn what did they mean by that. And so we have to give them grace and say, you know, I, I remember a friend saying, be in the people's uh, balconies, looking with it, at them from the balcony perspective, not from the basement perspective, assuming the worst of their motivation. You know, number three, so number one is avoid conspiracy theories. Two is try to understand what they're transmitting and what's motivating them and be gracious about that. And number three is that sometimes people really are just given over to sort of a sickness politically. And I think this can happen on both sides of the aisle where people are so given to like this political thing is my hope or the the fear, the raging fear of what if the other side wins and it becomes almost like the person is drunk. And I was thinking, you know, over and over again in the Old Testament, the imagery of judgment of God being given somebody what they want. Uh, giving their punishment in the image of the metaphor of drunkenness or giving a, a cup of wrath to drink and stumble and lose your way, that is often is the punishment of God. Um, I also hope and pray, and I think we can graciously hope if we see that, that it will also be the medicine that will bring redemption in their life, that they will their punishment will be corrective. I could go to a bunch of verses in the Old Testament where that is the way God lets your, your punishment is your uh, is is getting what you wanted? Think about all the quail that the Israelites get because they just moan and groan about not wanting the manna anymore. And so there's that drunkenness that is given, and to see maybe even the negative side uh, and the just disorientation that people can get, and have mercy on them and pray that it will be corrective and medicinal for them if people are getting what they want, or if they're drunk on the fear of not getting what they want out of the political decision. But that drunkenness thing leads me to another thought. And that is like, how can I respect somebody? I would need to respect them biblically, maybe a, a parent or an uncle or an aunt, a grandparent, somebody who I just really don't like the way they behave politically. 
um, who they vote for, how they talk about it, how deep they're into the stuff. And they just seem drunk. They just seem drunk on this whole thing. I was thinking of Genesis chapter 9, where Noah, who the Bible says was a righteous person, God saw him as righteous. He was the only one that was righteous at his time that God was able to work through, build the ark, and save humanity. And yet, even him, he gets drunk in chapter 9, kind of at the end of the Noah story. And, you know, one of his sons, Ham, it just says he went and looked on his father's nakedness. And that may be metaphorical for something funkier and worse that happened, but it's that's it's all cloaked cloaked in that metaphor. But what seems uh, very concrete and and true and admirable is the way the other two sons act, uh, Sh- Shem and Japheth. It says that they went in backwards, holding a cloak, and covered their father up. So they chose basically to not stare at what an exploit and to focus on and and to then disrespect their father um, who was drunk he was out of his mind at that at that moment he was not in his right senses and he was not even clothed he was it was obnoxious and uh and gross but they chose to not focus on that that we don't have to fully identify those loved ones by how they act politically you can choose to somewhat look away You can choose to somewhat walk backwards towards them to have a relationship and to not cast shame on them and, you know, not only retain that relationship, but retain that respect for someone who may very well be righteous. Noah was righteous, and yet he had some episodes that were really uh, unbecoming, and it would have been easy for... uh, all the sons to despise Noah and to break that relationship. And yet they, these two sons were honored for how that they responded to Noah. So that's not a passage you're going to hear spoken about a lot or taught about a lot, but it's struck me. And I have some regrets for how I've handled myself in regards to that in the past. Uh, unfortunately, my parents are uh, past since since the 2016 election and some of that stuff. We we were able to be more or less at peace about where we stood with all of that. But I wish that I had thought through this more deeply. And so avoid those conspiracy theories. Try to interpret people from the best possible perspective, understanding what they mean with what they're. Don't paint your own meaning behind how they are choosing to vote or uh, represent themselves Have mercy on the drunk and be discreet and honor. Choose to look away at times. It's not necessary for us to all uh, take on and focus on every indiscretion and place of disagreement. That's it. I'm praying for peace in the country and in your family and church uh, as we try to navigate this and maintain the peace of Christ and the unity of the faith.